Okay, everybody, welcome to Marketing Management, Chapter 2, Marketing Foundations, Global, Ethical, and Sustainable. So tonight's learning objectives are to identify the various levels in the global marketing experience curve. Global marketing is pretty much standard fare. Uh, the world markets are open now with the fall of communism back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the world has pretty much opened up. I mean, you still have a couple of holdouts, but uh, eventually all of the world will be a part of this world market and everybody will be participating. Um, learn the essential information components for assessing a global market opportunity. Define the key regional market zones and their marketing challenges. There may be, I'm not sure, I don't remember off here, but there may be a reference to NAFTA. All of you know that NAFTA was nixed, killed by uh, President Trump. Alleged, um, allegedly, according to what he says, NAFTA was the, one of the worst trade deals America ever got involved with. So if, if we see a reference to NAFTA, I will skip it because it's like talking about ancient history. It's gone. Um, these slides were made in advance, uh, actually in advance of that. So if there is a mention of NAFTA, we will skip it. There's no point in going into it. Um, describe the strategies for entering new global markets. Recognize key factors in creating a global product strategy. Learn the importance of ethics and marketing strategy, the value proposition, and the elements of the marketing mix, which is really the four P's of marketing product, price, place, and promotion, and how they're utilized in a marketing plan. Recognize the significance of sustainability as part of marketing strategy and the use of triple bottom line as a metric for evaluating corporate performance. So let's get into this. Any questions thus far? Okay, let me just hit the escape button. I don't know why it froze. One second. All right. So I'm going to just show you some of the slides may have on the bottom may have some form of explanation. So they're quite helpful. So I'm going to go out of the full view and leave it here. These are the instructor's notes on the bottom. The slides that I have uploaded to Canvas are my own slides. I didn't make them, but they're the slides that accompany the instructor manual. And as such, they're more robust. They have more information. So marketing is not limited by borders. Worldwide distribution networks, sophisticated communication tools, of course, the internet being one of the most sophisticated ones, not to mention um, affordable cellular phone service and the ability to call other countries at much cheaper prices. I remember when I was a kid, uh, calling another country was literally a very, very big expense. Greater product standardization and the internet have opened the world markets. Large and small companies do business globally. Opportunities are greater than ever, but so are risks, because the more countries that um, we, you know, dabble with or interact with, the greater the chance of a problem. Opportunities are greater than ever, as I mentioned, and global customers' needs may lead to product adaptation. The reason for that is you have different cultural needs, different needs all over the world. Um, and as such, companies have to address those needs and modify their products in many situations. So while the opportunities have, been, have never been greater, the risks have also never been higher. Global marketing mistakes are expensive. The international competitive landscape includes sophisticated global companies as well as successful local organizations. The operating environment varies dramatically around the world, creating real challenges for companies moving into new markets. Global customers demand different products, which means that successful products in a company's local market frequently have to be adapted to new markets in order to be relevant. Now, the basics of marketing is that you need to market to the needs of your customers. We've moved away from a production orientation, and this is stuff that's covered in your basic marketing class. Production orientation is long gone. You have to produce what the market needs and what the market wants. And if you do that, then you'll be successful. It is when you make what you want to make as a company and not take into consideration other elements, that's when you get into huge trouble. Okay, we move on. Uh, ladies, am I going too fast? If I am, I tend to speak a little quickly. If anybody feels that I, I'm going too quickly and I need to slow down or explain something in a previous slide, feel free to, you know, pop up. You want to raise your hand or you want to unmute yourself. You're not interrupting. I, I, Professor, can yes. you please make the screen bigger? Um, if I make the screen bigger, I don't know if I can yeah. capture everything. I will do my best. Um, like just open the this this. Screen. If I do, this is what happens. You mi you miss all the stuff in the bottom. See this? 
okay. I need, I need, no, no, it's okay. I, I need to have that opened. So what you could do is on your okay. end, if you want to, you know, you want to just um, look at it, you, you want to open up, it, you want to open it on your phone or on another device, you could do that. Okay. On the bottom right, you can zoom in a little bit where there's like a plus and a minus on the bottom right. You can yeah, I don't know. The problem is it doesn't help you with the bottom bottom stuff. Whoever's on the bottom. No, it's okay. We're at the bottom. Okay, it's okay. Thank I mean, you. I could leave it like this. Okay, fine. So let's move on. Uh, actually, the problem is I zoomed in too much now. Okay, the global experience learning curve. Four distinct stages. No foreign marketing. Then you go to foreign marketing. Then you go to international marketing, you know, a couple of countries outside of your country, and then full-blown viral global marketing. The global experience learning curve moves a company through four distinct stages. No foreign marketing, that meaning just, you know, domestic foreign marketing, international marketing, a glo and global marketing. Now, I mean, it's a little bit redundant, foreign and international. I guess, Really, if I were making this, I would skip the foreign part and just goes either go to foreign or international and then global. International means that you're going to other countries, but you're not going all over the world. You may just stay in Europe. You may just stay in Asia. You may just stay in Central America. So again, the, um, the stages are no foreign marketing, foreign marketing, international marketing, and global marketing. The process is not always linear. Companies may, for example, move directly from no foreign marketing to international without necessarily engaging in foreign marketing. Uh, in addition, the amount of time spent in any stage can vary. Some companies remain in a stage for many years. Sometimes companies are crazy. They just go global. They just go all over the place in one shot. The easiest way to do that, obviously, is with the internet. But most companies do test marketing. They, they're not that... I mean, I, I can't remember... I, I can't think as, of an example of a company right now that went global without doing anything else right away. I'm sure there are. We can Google them and look at them later. But it's advisable anytime you launch a new product that you, you do a little bit of a test launch to make sure that the product is viable. And really, the best way to do this is to follow this. Okay, let's... Uh, yes, what's the difference, though, between foreign and international? I, 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 I addressed that before I said that I, I don't really see a difference. I, 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 if I were doing this, I would totally remove foreign marketing because what, is it, what does international mean? You tell me. You, what you, you said that it's between different countries, but that's what foreign is. Exactly. So it's it's redundant. Um, it, it it really is redundant. I mean, when you're going international, maybe it's a maybe it's a function of how many countries you go to, which is silly. I mean, you're going to start saying, okay, this level has three countries, this one has nine countries in your in your in your strategy. It it for all intents and purposes, if I were writing this, I would have done no foreign to international or to foreign and then global. Global is more global. It's all over the world, so to speak. Okay, companies with no foreign marketing. Companies, well, <clears throat> companies with no direct foreign marketing may still do business with international customers through intermediaries or limited direct contact. They may fulfill unsolicited orders, but these are incidental. So, of course, any company with a website is now global. So, yes, I mean, if you launch a website and you're totally an e-business, then you've skipped all the stages. So any company that doesn't have any brick and mortar and is just a, um, a website would be an example of a global company. So What about if it doesn't ship to, if it doesn't ship internationally? If it doesn't ship internationally, then it can't be considered global. I mean, global means that anybody in the world can get your product or service. If, you, if you're barred from getting it, if it's impossible to get it, uh, then, it's, then it's not that. Um, but like Amazon, Wait. Amazon is, is your essence of global. I mean, I, I, maybe there are countries I would imagine like North Korea doesn't allow Amazon to ship to it, but most countries, you know, I can't think of many countries really that don't, unless it's like Somalia or something like that. Yes. You were saying. Question. Yeah. Um, so basically what's it, so what's the difference between global, international and foreign? Like, is it global is more the same or global different? No, global is more expansive than international. international right. Because it's all over the world as opposed to, you know, one continent, two continents. It's all over. It's global. It's everywhere. Like, Coca-Cola is a global company. It's not just in Europe. It's not just in South America. It's everywhere, except the North Pole or the South Pole. So international is... Is a stage before global. Like, why is it international? Yeah. It's, it's like when you take an international flight, right? What does an international flight mean? You're going from one nation to another. So, so we start off with no foreign marketing, then we go into companies 
with foreign marketing. Companies follow existing customers into foreign markets. Develops local distributions and service representation by using local intermediaries or establishing its own direct sale force. Key activities are done in the home country, but modified for international markets. Um, that may be the difference, but again, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I like simplifying things. I don't like making these small little differences. Global markets are important enough for management to build international sales forecasts. In other words, looking to see what the world at large, you know, internationally would be needing. And manufacturing allocates time specifically to international production. At this point, international markets are no longer an afterthought, but rather an integral, albeit small part of the company's growth model. I don't necessarily agree with it. It's a small part of the company's growth model. I think today, as the world gets more connected with the internet, meaning that high-speed internet becomes standard in countries that used to not have it, smartphone usage becomes standard. In fact, you could actually judge a country's wealth by the amount of internet access it has through smartphones and other devices. If 98% of a country has smartphone connectivity and smartphones, that means that the, um, the, the wealth of that nation is great because in order to afford a smartphone, it's expensive. Unless you're getting one of these free smartphones, but even then, even if you're getting the free smartphones, somebody's paying for it, whether it's the government or the person themselves if it's not free, but a, a smartphone costs a lot of money. I mean, the phone itself, most people don't buy the phone outright, although some people do, but how much does a smartphone cost? A cheap one, not less than $600, unless you're buying something really, really stripped down. But most smartphones are anywhere between 700 all the way up to your $1,300 limit. I mean, they're coming out with smartphones now that are pretty much eleven to $1,300. Obviously, those are not the mainstream ones, but your average smartphone, like my S20 Plus, is $1,000. It's $1,100. I got a rebate on it, but if I were to buy it outright, that's what it would cost. That means that everybody that has a smartphone has connection to the internet. And I'll let you know a little secret. A lot of people, like myself, use my smartphone or use our smartphones more than they use their computers to shop. For me, I don't know about you, for me, it's much more convenient for me to go on my Amazon account, on my phone, browse for something, hit one click and boom, it's there. Rather than going on the computer, typing it in, waiting for, it's much, it's much more convenient if I use my phone. And the more phone usage there is, the greater the marketing efforts should be. International, firm begins to manufacture products outside the home market. So this is really the, the, the small, this is really the main difference between foreign and international. This is that one difference. I don't know if I would have made a separate slide for it, but the way I see it here is in the foreign marketing, you pretty much produce everything in your country and then you send it out. In international marketing, the key difference is the firm begins to manufacture products outside the US. Global markets are essential to corporate growth and that's the launching pad for, for global. Think of it as hopscotch or think of it as a frog, leapfrogging. Once you stop just producing in America, now you start producing in England, in France, in South America, now you have the wherewithal to really become a global company. So in order to get that international marketing stamp, you have to start producing in, interna in, in foreign markets. Global And firms establish an international business division or unit. So for example, when Ford opened up in England, remember Ford was an American company, it was, it was in Michigan, and at some point in time it went to England. It went to other countries in Europe. So at that point, it has a European division. It'll have a South American division. In fact, Japan, and um, Trump was very responsible for this, got Japan to open up more plants in America. So you now have, I think it's in Kentucky, I'm not sure, Tennessee, I don't remember offhand, but in one of those two states, you have a massive Toyota plant. And that's an example of Toyota coming here to America, which is great, great for America, because now you're, you're producing, uh, you're, you're, you're employing more people in the auto industry. Uh, management may still have a domestic first mindset. In other words, even though products are being made in other countries, but they may have that mindset of, I wanna do it still, I, I'm, I'm focusing more on my country. But, as I mentioned before, with the internet spreading and becoming more normalized and used even like third world or emerging markets, um, that domestic first is not necessarily going to be the prevailing mindset. Now, 
So we understand the difference in the inter the, that slight difference. You see why I, I didn't really want to, um, you know, get too fine between the two because it's easy to get confused. So the main difference between foreign and international is the distribution. It's not the distribution, it's actual production. Production in the home country, key activities like uh, the marketing or maybe the packaging and research and development, for example, is done domestically. And then they start going and modify the product for international markets to be used for their tastes. Now, but in the international marketing, they get more uh, settled or they spread their tentacles into other countries and start producing and making things there from, from the ground up. Where are we clear in that differentiation? Yes? Yes. Look, if I were writing this slide, I would have kind of sandwiched it into one slide and just say the key difference between the two is that one small point. Okay, global marketing. Firm views the world as a single market with many different segments. Now, that's massive if you think about it. What is a domestic market? It's your home market with market segments. Mass marketing is still done, but there's a lot of market segmentation. And the reason for that is very simple. You want to meet the specific needs of your clientele. In order to meet those specific needs, you need to basically have the ability to reach out to people to make sure that you're available to them and give them what they need. So global marketing firm views the world as a single market with many different segments. 50% or more of revenue comes from international markets. So this is really what makes you a global market is that your, your focus, you're, you're so focused on growth in other countries that half of your revenue comes from the international arena. Global marketing firms see segments that may or may not align with country boundaries. International marketing firms define markets along traditional political boundaries, whereas global takes it one step. In international, like I mentioned, it's in a few countries. So you may just say, okay, I'm going to focus on Italy, Spain, England, and I don't know, France. Okay, that may be the extent of your international presence. But what a global marketing strategy does, it looks outside of the box, so to speak. And it looks at the entire world as one big mega market with multiple little segments. And the, and the boundaries or the, the actual borders are blurred because they don't care about the borders. They care more about marketing to the world in one shot, in, in one fell swoop. Moving to global marketing depends on research critical for decision makers. And a lot of that is understanding the tastes of foreign markets. As an example, when McDonald's, and this I saw a video on this years and years ago, when McDonald's opened up in India, they had a massive issue. And what's the massive issue? It's very simple. Um, beef is not eaten in India. I mean, unless you're not a religious Hindu and there are people that may eat beef, but it is a deity. They worship the cow. So the challenge for McDonald's was, how do we make burgers that are not beef? Now, if you're not imaginative, you'd say, you know what? Uh, it doesn't fit our, our, our you know, it's not, it's not our style. It doesn't make sense. This market doesn't make sense. Forget about India. We'll just stick to the rest of the world. Can't you forget about India? I mean, India now has over a billion people. And at the time that McDonald's went there, they had a couple hundred million people. It's like saying, nah, we're not going to go to the United States. No country would want to lose hundreds of millions of, of meal opportunities. So they had to modify. They, they offered fish menus and goat and lamb and, 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 and chicken and other things. And they source things out locally as much as they could to drive down costs so they don't have to import things. And wherever they had to import sauces and all kinds of other things, they would. And they invested in teaching farmers, local farmers, how to farm better to produce things like potatoes and french fries. That, that you need to have. You can't have a burger without french fries. It's like peanut butter without jelly. It's not working. So you need to have those elements. But again, global marketing is looking at the world as one large, mar as one large market with multiple segments. And the nations themselves could be the market segments. Depends how you want to set it up. Are we clear so far? Yes? Ladies, are we good? Okay, I'm assuming that we are good. Yeah. All right, let's move on. All right, so this we can expand. It's a little bit too small, so we must expand it. Exhibit 2.2, 10 examples of global companies and, and their expansion in global markets. Um, here's one, Walmart established in 1962. Years to expansion, 29. 1991, Walmart opens two units in Mexico City. Years to expansion, 20. Hewlett Packard, HP. That's, um, what does years to expansion mean? How many years did they, did, um, did they, how many years ago? Well, when did they expand? 
and how long did they expand? In other words, look, Hewlett Packard was established in 39, so 20 years later, in 1959, HP sets up a European marketing organization in Geneva. So like how long it took them to get there? Yes, exactly, precisely. And then you have Tyson Foods, 1989, 26 years. Uh, Tyson establishes a partnership with a Mexican poultry company to create an international partnership. And the list goes on. Caterpillar, anybody know what Caterpillar does? They make tractors. Yeah, tractors, and... backhoes, all kinds of stuff. Home Depot, Gap, Goodyear, FedEx, and PepsiCo. Now, PepsiCo is different than Pepsi-Cola. PepsiCo is the umbrella organization that owns Pepsi-Cola. PepsiCo is like Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson owns Band-Aid, Tylenol, Johnson & Johnson, Floor Wax, and many, many other products. So PepsiCo, in, in its establishment, one year after establishment, Pepsi enters Japan and Eastern Europe. That was, a, that was a big splash. And PepsiCo as a whole is a large entity, something very, very impressive. So let's look at the global experience learning curve. And let's um, see if there's anything here. Yes, there's a lot. There's a lot to speak out over here. So let's just go through the slide itself, and then we'll move on to the bottom of the slide. So there are five components of essential information that relate to global marketing experience and international expansion. Okay, um, there's economic environment, cultural and societal trends, business environment, political and legal changes, specific market conditions. You have the economic environment, an accurate understanding of the current economic environment, such as the GDP, the gross domestic product, inflation, strength of currency, and business cycles. Uh, trends is essential, also depending on the company's target markets, consumer or business addition, uh, or businesses, additional economic data on consumer spending per capita, which is important. How, mu how, many, how much do people spend? Or industrial purchasing trends are also needed to facilitate decision-making. Then, of course, we need to look at culture, societal, societal trends. Understanding a global market's culture and their social trends is fundamental for consumer products and helpful to business-to-business -to -business markets. Cultural values, symbols, and rituals, very important. And cultural differences affect people's perception of products, while B2B companies must learn local cultural practices to recruit employees and establish good business relationship with the local markets. When Disney opened up in China, they did a lot of research. They had to. Without doing that research, they would be totally lost and totally missed the boat. I just want to just do something here. Um, I want to just give everybody easy definitions here for GDP and for G we mentioned D GDP. Okay? So... Okay, simple question. Okay, so gross domestic product, abbreviated GDP, is the total value of goods and services produced in a country. Okay, it's measure. Okay, that's the that's the best way to look at it. Total value of goods and services produced in a country. Now, most of you learned that in economics, but it's, sometimes it's hard to remember all these terms. So it's good to sometimes look things up and you know recollect. Emerging markets, and I actually have a video that I posted on emerging markets, perhaps I'll watch it soon. For most of the 20th century, world economic growth came from the triad, Western Europe, the United States, and Japan. Japan was massive, 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 massive. Um, in World War I, nobody knows this, but Japan won a war, the Sino-Japanese War. They won a war against Russia. Now, Russia was in the boondocks because they, you know, on the Tsarist Russia started crumbling already. Their military was not as strong, but they beat Russia, I believe it was in 1905. So that was big, big, big stuff. So the Japanese were huge. That's why in World War II they played a major role, and they were the Axis, and they had tremendous uh, resources because they pillaged uh, China and, you know, the Philippines and, you know, Vietnam, that whole area. And they took away all the different resources. Seventy uh, for the past twenty-five years, growth has been in emerging markets, such as the Eastern Bloc nations, which at one point were blocked off. And now, I mean, like Russia now, I think has the most billionaires living in there. Seventy-five percent of growth will come from emerging markets, mainly like China and India. Now, with China, who knows what will happen? Depending on who wins the election, I could assure you, if Trump wins the election, he's going to punish China with murderous sanctions for. The coronavirus. He's going to absolutely, uh, I would say, single-handedly wage economic war against him. 
So China definitely wants Biden to win, not Trump, because they know quite good and well if Trump wins. I could I could totally see him bringing the leadership of China to a war tribunal, some sort of you know place where they get thrown into jail, kind of like after the Serbian and Bosnian War. Multinational regional markets. I actually have a question about that. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm just wondering, how could Trump 